Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. In today's video, we're going to discuss, in no particular order, five of the most powerful sea monsters in Greek mythology. Before we jump into our first entry, I'd like to quickly preface with a short disclaimer, which is that neither the Hippocampoi, half-horse, half-fish creatures, nor the Ichthyocentaurs, centaurs with lobster claws and fish tails, are going to feature on this list. So, apologies in advance if you were hoping for a spotlight on either of those. This video is going to focus on the variety bent on shedding blood and extinguishing life. Let's get into it. Starting us off are the Sirens. The Sirens were female monsters of hybrid appearance, possessing human heads and the bodies of giant birds. Other descriptions gave them human arms that played musical instruments. They were originally the handmaidens of the goddess Persephone, but when she was abducted by Hades, Demeter gave them bird bodies so that they could cover more ground in the search. The siren song was so beautiful and enchanting that it utterly bewitched and entranced any who heard it, so that those caught in its spell could not see the thorns beneath the petals. Sailors brought their ships ever closer, desperate to hear the song as loudly and clearly as possible. But their minds were so taken that the jagged rocks their ships rapidly approached went unnoticed. Ultimately, sailors were reduced to bloated corpses, and ships were reduced to sunken wrecks that littered the ocean floor. The two most famous encounters with the Sirens were Jason and the Argonauts and Odysseus and his crew. Orpheus saved the first group by drowning out the Siren's song with his own music, and Odysseus survived by lashing himself to the mast and having his crew plug their ears with beeswax. Next we have Cetus. Signed by the sea god Phorcus, Cetus was the sea monster sent by Poseidon to bring death and destruction to the land of Troy after King Laomedon reneged on his promise to pay Poseidon, who worked at building the walls of Troy for an entire year. An oracle revealed that the only way Laomedon could extricate his kingdom from the plight his avarice and lack of integrity embroiled it in was by chaining his daughter to a cliff and sacrificing her to the monster. Fortunately, she didn't end up dying, for a bargain was struck in which Hercules agreed to kill the monster in exchange for Laomedon's immortal horses. But again, true to form, Laomedon reneged on his promise, giving nothing after his daughter was saved. This second slight would be tantamount to signing his own death warrant, though, for it was not wise to make yourself an enemy of Hercules, who delivered the king's comeuppance when he returned with six ships, sacked Troy, and killed Laomedon. Next, we have basically the same scenario but with Perseus. The monster is either also Cetus or some unnamed minion of Poseidon, depending on the version. After slaying Medusa, Perseus used his winged sandals to fly home. Land and water wheeled below him, but his eyes eventually fell on a beautiful woman, the princess Andromeda, chained to a cliff. Her mother, Cassiopeia, had boasted that her daughter was more beautiful than all the nymphs of the sea. As punishment for her hubris, Poseidon sent a sea monster to ravage the land of Ethiopia, of which Andromeda's father was king. An oracle was consulted, and it was said that the monster would only relent if Andromeda was sacrificed to it. Much like Hercules, Perseus later struck a bargain, offering to kill the monster in exchange for Andromeda's hand in marriage. And so, the monster was killed, and Perseus won himself a wife. Finishing off this list are Scylla and Charybdis, both of whom we're going to discuss at the same time. They were neighbors, so you can't really talk about one without the other. They lived across from each other, occupying opposite sides of a strait, which was made virtually impassable because of them. Attempting to sail through was to court death. These two monsters featured most prominently in two stories. The quest for the Golden Fleece, when Jason and his crew made their return trip after obtaining the fleece, and the Odyssey, in which Odysseus is forced to endure a ten-year journey home fraught with danger and suffering after the Trojan War. Jason had a much easier time negotiating this obstacle than Odysseus did, he and his crew were able to circumvent the strait, thus avoiding both Scylla and Charybdis, by having their vessel guided safely through the Planktai rocks by the water nymphs. Odysseus was not afforded such a luxury, instead forced to decide which danger he'd rather brave. He was left with the perilous dilemma of choosing which side of the strait he should sail his ship down, and incidentally, it was this dilemma from which arose the expression between a rock and a hard place. On one side was Charybdis, 
A great fig tree that grew from the abutting cliff showed exactly where she lurked beneath the ocean's surface. Though there is little to no information concerning Charybdis's appearance, her immense size is a given. Three times each day, she sucked a vast amount of water that a powerful whirlpool was created, powerful enough to consume any ships and fortunate enough to find themselves nearby. And it was said that Poseidon himself, the mighty Earthshaker, was powerless to rescue those caught in Charybdis's vortex. On the other side of the strait was Scylla's lair, which was a cave embedded in the cliffside. Ships that passed by had its sailors snatched off the deck, and larger prey beneath the surface, like sharks, dolphins, and whales, made for frequent meals. Where descriptive information pertaining to Charybdis was sparse, it was abundant for Scylla. Here's a passage from the Odyssey that described what she looked like. She has twelve legs, all writhing, dangling down, and six long swaying necks, a hideous head on each, each head barbed with a triple row of fangs, thick set, packed tight, and armed to the hilt with black death. Per Ovid's account, Scylla was pursued by the sea god Glaucus, but after being rejected, he sought out the sorceress Circe to cure his lovesickness and punish Scylla. A potion was poured into Scylla's favorite bathing pool, so the next time she went in, she was horribly transformed. In the end, Odysseus takes his ship past Scylla, deducing that losing several members of his crew, while lamentable, is preferable to having the whole ship and everyone on it dragged down to the crushing black depths. And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed the content, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. As always, leave your video suggestions down below.